translation. By the inclination to serve the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, suffering humanity can immediately cleanse the dirt which has accumulated in their minds during innumerable births, like the Ganges water which emanates from the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord. Such a process immediately cleanses the mind and thus spiritual or Krishna consciousness gradually increases. Purport. In India one can actually see that a person who takes a bath in the Ganges water daily is almost free from all kinds of diseases. A very respectable, respectable Brahmin in Calcutta never took a doctor's medicine. Even though he sometimes felt sick, he would not accept medicine from the physician, but would simply drink Ganges water, and he was always cured within a very short time. The glories of Ganges water are known to Indians and to ourselves also. The river Ganges flows by Calcutta. Sometimes within the water there are many stools and other dirty things which are washed away from neighboring mills and factories. But still, thousands of men take baths in the Ganges water, and they are very healthy as well as spiritually inclined. That is the effect of Ganges water. The Ganges is glorified because it emanates from the toes of the lotus feet of the Lord. Similarly, if one takes to the service of the lotus feet of the Lord or takes to Krishna consciousness, he is immediately cleansed of the many dirty things which have accumulated in his innumerable births. We have seen that in spite of the very black record of their past lives, Persons who take to Krishna consciousness become perfectly cleansed of all dirty things and make spiritual progress very swiftly. Therefore, Prita Maharaj advises that without the benediction of the Supreme Lord, one cannot make advancement, either in so-called morality, economic development, or sense gratification. One should therefore take to the service of the Lord or Krishna consciousness and thus very soon become a perfect man, as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Being a responsible king, Prita Maharaj recommends that everyone takes shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and thus he immediately purified and thus be immediately purified. Lord Sri Krishna also says in Bhagavad Gita that simply by surrendering unto him one is immediately relieved of all sinful reactions. As Krishna takes away all the sinful reactions of a person immediately upon his surrender unto him, similarly, the external manifestation of Krishna, the representative of Krishna who acts as the mercy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, takes all the resultant actions of the sinful life of the disciple immediately after the disciple's initiation. Thus, if the disciple follows the principles instructed by the spiritual master, he remains purified and is not contaminated by the material infection. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore stated that the spiritual master who plays the part of Krishna's representative has to consume all the reactions, all the sinful reactions of his disciple. Sometimes a spiritual master takes the risk of being overwhelmed by the sinful reactions of the disciples and undergoes a sort of tribulation due to their acceptance. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu therefore advised that one not accept many disciples. Om Ajnana Timarandasya Gyananana Salakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Sri Gurve Nama Sri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sigoro Si Yutapadakamalam Sigurun Vaisnavam Stha Si Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Saitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Si Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sivisakan Vitam Stha he Krishna Karuna Sindo Dinabando Jagatpate Gopesa Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radha Evindavaneshwari Visabana Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalpa Trubhyacha Sakripa Sindubhyevacha 
Paditanam Pavane Bhyo Vaisnavibhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadada Shri Vasani Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare In the previous verse Prita Maharaj has described the Chatu Varga or the four processes of regulated life through Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. Um, the concept of the Vedic culture is that the activities of Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha are regulated activities, uh, not just random, but rather uh, there is a prescribed duty for everyone in society. Um, but still, in Bhagavatam, it is clearly stated that uh, such activities of Varnashram within themselves are not adequate. Uh, they need to be sansidir haritosinam. They need to be uh, performed for the pleasure of the Supreme Lord. Uh, then, when that connection has, established, has been established, then these activities of Varnashram uh, transform to the transcendental platform. They become devotional service. Um, devotional service is glorified as the only activity that can fully satisfy the self. Savai pumso paro dharmo yato bhaktira doksa de haitaki apatiyata yayatma supasidati. Only devotional service that is unmotivated and uninterrupted can fully satisfy the self. Um, thus in this verse, Prithu Maharaj is glorifying the, uh, the process of devotional service. Um, um, even in the, in the Vedic culture, it was not always thoroughly understood what was the ultimate goal of life. Um, even in the Vedic culture, the flowery words of the Vedas were bewildering many classes of men. Uh, and not everyone understood that the goal of life was to worship Sri Krishna. Bhavanam janmanamam te jnanavamam prapadyante vasudeva sravamiti samahatma sudulabha. Bhagavad Gita in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains this. He establishes that it may take many, many births before one comes to the point that finally he accepts that Krishna is everything, that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Uh, in the uh, Bhagavad Gita also, uh, Krishna clearly establishes that uh, those who worship Anya Devata or other deities uh, they are alpa buddhya, they are less intelligent. prapandyante uh, uh, devata. Those who are worshipping other devas, uh, their consciousness has become uh, captured by their material desires. Uh, thus, such kind of worship motivated by material desire is never on the transcendental plane. Therefore, such kind of religious principles are within the realm of mundane activities. Trigunya visya veda, or a portion of the Vedas is simply trigunya, remaining within the three gunas. The three gunas, the word guna is generally translated as quality, but sometimes also translated as rope or that which binds. Uh, thus, they remain bound within the three gunas. Uh, so, uh, Prithu Maharaj, um, being the, the ruler of the entire earth, was establishing very clearly for the entire earth uh, what the uh, paramgati was, the ultimate goal of life. Vasudeva uh, paragati. He was establishing that it is Vasudev, devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, 
this movement, the Brahma Madhava Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya, is exclusively dedicated to that purpose, to worshipping the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, within this movement, there is no doubt about who is our Easter Dave, who is our worshipable deity. But uh, in, the, in the world of Vedic culture, this is not so clear. There is plenty of, uh, of different opinions and different understandings. Um, we understand that such different opinions are there, and we remember that at the beginning of Bhagavatam, it is described that uh, Vyasadev, he divided up the original Vedic knowledge into four Vedas. It is said originally that knowledge was... Uh, all included in one Veda, he divided it up into four Vedas and subsequently he also um, provided to Puranas for further knowledge, Mahabharat and so on. And in all these uh, he provided uh, spiritual instruction for people on different levels. Uh, and thus there is spiritual instruction given for those who are more entangled in this material energy and who can, through worship of the demigods, regulate their strong tendencies for sense gratification because they are not ready to give up these tendencies for sense gratification. They are too attached. Then, all right, then purify them through a process of regulation. And thus, the Vedas offer so many regulated processes by which one can regulate his sense gratification. But this can never offer one freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Uh, thus, uh, such activities are condemned in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is dedicated only to pure devotional service. Esrama evihi kevalam is simply a waste of time. Uh, thus, we will also not waste our time after all that and we will simply talk about Krishna and about his lotus feet and about pure devotional service to Krishna. Um, this pure devotional service to Krishna uh, is a very demanding thing uh, because it does not provide for any compromise. Uh, there is no question in this process of maintaining any compromise. Yes, we'll accept anyone from the most compromised position, a person who has become thoroughly attached, thoroughly sinful, thoroughly conditioned by long-term sinful behavior. Welcome. And such a person may require some time uh, to overcome this material attachment and conditioning, but uh, the goal is fixed. There is no question that it ever changes. The standard is the standard. Uh, uncompromised pure devotional service. Nothing else. And anything less is not good enough. So no one can ever be comfortable in this movement and sort of feel, well, uh, at least I'm doing many things. Maybe not everything, but I'm doing something. Uh, I'm, I'm at least... Uh, Partially uh, surrendered, not good enough, right? absolutely unacceptable, totally rejected, condemned, wrong. Uh, you have, you're missing the boat, right? Uh, and life is very short. So we cannot uh, be too soft with ourselves, uh, pussyfooting. Uh, uh, it won't really... Uh, work. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, doctor yourself. Uh, it's like it's very hard when there is a huge boil to just take a knife and just stick it in. Uh, generally, one goes to a doctor who is ruthless, right? who is absolutely merciless, and takes that big scalpel and cuts too much. Uh, thus. Uh, it is said that uh, one requires a spiritual master. Um, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur gave a 
nice description of the spiritual master. It said, who is like the person who is offering a goat on the sacrificial altar and who lifts his knife mercilessly, ready to slaughter that goat. In the same way, the spiritual master looks at our false ego, which we are trying to hide. No, it's not there. And lifts his, his sharp edged knife and is ready to cut, to cut at our false ego. Um, uh, that's a little shocking. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was quite strong and outspoken. Um, he explained that Guru is heavy and he spoke about the heaviness of Guru and he explained, he qualified this heaviness in various ways. He said, one, a spiritual master should become heavy by, uh, by his commitment. It is the commitment that makes one heavy. If one has no commitment, one remains very light. Then, at the slightest pushings of the three modes of material nature, one blows in all directions. But if we become heavy in our commitment uh, to Krishna, then uh, we become immovable. Uh, and that is the position of the spiritual master. That is why the spiritual master is described to be heavy, because he is immovable. He remains fixed, irregardless of the external circumstances at the lotus feet of the Lord. Mana Krishna Padara Vindayo. He has truly fixed his mind at the lotus feet of Krishna. He acts only for the pleasure of Krishna. Um, so somehow or other, um, that is the goal of this movement. And we should therefore increase our commitment. Um, we should somehow or other become more serious in our spiritual life and step by step we should uh, adopt the process of devotional service. Um, uh, the, uh, when we speak about the topic of Guru Tattva, it's a huge topic and uh, it begins with uh, Balaram or Lord Nichananda who are known as Adi Guru, the original spiritual master. Um, when we are looking at Lord Nichananda, then we, or Balaram, then we see that uh, they are serving the Supreme Lord, first of all, as a menial servant. Uh, Balaram becomes the bed of the Lord, becomes the shoes of the Lord, becomes the, the plate of the Lord, becomes all the paraphernalia of the Lord. In this way, we can see that he becomes the menial servant of the Supreme Lord. So it begins with being the menial servant. Uh, then we're seeing that uh, he takes up the mission of the Lord. Like Lord Nichananda is the primary preacher in Lord Chaitanya's mission. Uh, it was through Lord Nichananda that actually Krishna consciousness started to spread all over Bengal and it was uh, while Lord Chaitanya remained in Puri deeply absorbed in transcendental consciousness Nichananda was going door to door he was taking up the mission of the Lord and uh, third we are seeing that Lord Nichananda is known also his expansion is known as Ananta Sej who is constantly glorifying the Lord, non-stop, with unlimited mouth. Uh, therefore it is said that the mouth of Ananta is the jewel case of the glorification of the Lord. So these are the three principal elements that we recognize in Guru Tattva, uh, that we recognize me, to be the menial servant of the Lord, to take up the mission of the Lord, and to constantly glorify the Lord. Uh, and that is... Uh, the nature of a spiritual master. Um, th that's his occupation. Of course, Srila Prabhupada didn't restrict the, or rather Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, didn't restrict the uh, occupation of spiritual master 
to a chosen few, uh, but rather pointed out that it was the duty of every Vaishnava to become a spiritual master. Yarede kittara kaha Krishna upadesh amar agyaya hoye tare. Amar agyaya guru hoye tare edesh. So one must, uh, everyone must become a spiritual master by instructing others in Krishna consciousness. Um, that is the principal point and that is the only means by becoming absorbed in pure devotional service. Um, various practices are required in spiritual life. Um, we are required, first of all, to go deep in our own spiritual practices. Um, we see that Srila Rupa Goswami has in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu outlined the process of devotional service in, in a very detailed way. And uh, there are 64 aspects of bhakti described, the 64 limbs of devotional service. And these limbs of devotional service, um, when further subdivided, are showing that in various ways the senses and the mind are engaged in the service of the Lord. And that is the whole purpose, uh, to somehow or other engage the senses and the mind in the service of the Lord. Now, the Narada Pancharatra confirms that Sarvopadi Vinir Muktam Tatvaratvena Nirmalam Rishikena Rishikesha Sevanam Bhakti Uchute. So uh, we have to somehow or other uh, always engage our senses in the service of the Lord, which is interesting because basically these senses are material. Right? Basically, it means that uh, that same material energy that otherwise entraps us and ensnares us into material existence and binds us, that same material energy can liberate us from uh, our material entanglement, from our bodily existence. We use the very body itself uh, for, uh, for our purification and to develop our attachment to the Supreme Lord. That is a very important element uh, um, and that is the, uh, the special process of devotional service. Um, we see that the impersonalist has a very harsh process um, because his entire bodily existence is maya. For the impersonalist, the body is part of the illusory reality and there is nothing positive about it. It is just negative. It is just to be rejected. And the whole physical reality, the whole phenomenal world is just to be given up. And any possible appreciation for it is maya. Anything. Uh, whereas we see, described in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, that when we see beauty in this world, know it to be the smile of Krishna. Which is, is such a nice quote. I mean, to me it's soothing to the heart because it means that we can we can be in the material world and we can appreciate it eh? we can say the snow is beautiful especially from inside with the heater on <laughs> uh, we can say eh? it is there it's not that we have to say look at this other horrible form of maya snow it's just hell uh, no it has beauty also if one is nicely Situated. Uh, <clears throat> nicely situated means for an adult to be inside or to be in a child body. When we're in a child body, snow is always ecstasy. Uh, uh, so, what can be said? Uh, anyway, my point is, is that there is appreciation for the material energy. That it is not just all illusion, not all to be rejected, but we can recognize Krishna within it. Uh, not that we are necessarily uh, getting totally carried away by the beauty of the material nature and start writing poetry and get lost and just, oh, so wonderful. No, but how wonderful is Krishna? How wonderful is Krishna that actually such an intricate arrangement can exist and it just 
it sort of reveals his transcendental nature uh, in this way. A the process of devotional service is not harsh. It is not a process of self-denial. It is not a process of constant negation. No, 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 in all directions. No, take it away. Uh, uh, as we find in, uh, in Nir Vishesh and Sunyavat, uh, the impersonalist and the Buddhist, they are following a process of negation. And I recall, um, before Krishna consciousness, I was reading all kinds of books, and I remember uh, reading the um, biography of Mila Repa, who is a famous uh, ascetic in Buddhism. Right? And it is, it is said that Mila Repa lived in a cave in the Himalayas and lived for 30 years on grass soup. And the, res and the result was that his body turned green. <laughs> so that didn't impress me. <laughs> I, thought of, I thought about that and I thought, does it have to be like that? Uh, does spiritual life really have to be like that? That one simply eats grass soup for his entire life. 30 years means practically your whole adult life, you know. Uh, so, and then turn green. Uh, I was wondering about it. Does it have to be such a punishment? Uh, so, devotional service is, is very wonderful. Because in devotional service, we can find full satisfaction. Uh, we can use all the beauty in this world. We can use all the goodness in this world and simply offer it to Krishna. We offer the most delicious preparations to Krishna, the best of the best. Spend like days in the kitchen to somehow or other make it totally exquisite, offer it to Krishna and relish the Mahaprasadam. That is possible in this process because we can engage the senses in the service of the Lord. Thus it is not a process of negation, it is rather a process of sublimation, a process of using the senses in a better way. Instead of, of human, human life which resembles animal life, where we know what is the interest of the dog? Just think of his nose. Where is the nose going? Sniffing at other dogs, particularly at certain parts of the body. Uh, so the animal uh, consciousness gradually winds up there. Uh, simply metunya agra, simply a chain of sex life. It is sometimes we speak about the train of thought, uh, like the concept that thoughts are like coaches that are all linked together. And we know where the train of thought ends. Right? The last coach is always sex life. Somehow or other you get there in the material world. Right? It happens like that. Um, it reminds me of something in the Lila Amrita where Brahmananda was uh, speaking to Prabhupada and said to Prabhupada that in university, he had a teacher who was basically totally influenced by Freudian philosophy and who's, who insisted that everything in this world was just based on sex. And Brahmananda said that, but that he had disagreed with his teacher and that he had written an essay how actually underneath, right, underneath everything there is a deep spiritual drive within everyone looking for the absolute truth and he presented it to Prabhupada like that like how he was you know had a greater insight than his teacher and Prabhupada said your teacher was right <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, everything in this material world is based on sex life sometimes it is said that simply all the natural arrangements, the beautiful meadows, the beautiful for forests, the waterfalls, the daffodils, and the little flowers, and whatever is there, it's all simply a backdrop for one thing, sexual activity. Again, Bhagavatam. So in this way, 
um, the living being is deeply, uh, deeply entangled in lusty activity. Um, and the entire world is just, just filled with this lust and everything is connected to lust. But yet, when we take up to uh, devotional service, then this lust transforms. Admindriya pritivan shatara bolikam, krishnindriya pritivan shatara premanam. That uh, when we are interested in satisfying our own senses, yes, then it's all lust. But when we become interested in satisfying the senses of Krishna, then it becomes love. And then the very same material objects become actually an asset. In this way, um, a bona fide spiritual master can teach a natural path, uh, unlike the impersonalist who teach a very unnatural path, a path of denying the self. But Krishna consciousness, as Srila Prabhupada explained, is not an artificial imposition on the mind. It is rather completely natural and it engages um, all our natural propensities. Um, um, however, in the beginning, uh, it doesn't feel so natural at all. It feels like there is a lot of force involved to control the senses, to follow the four regulative principles, a lot of struggle, trial and error, uh, some slips, uh, this path is very difficult, my feet are slipping again and again. So uh, indeed, we are facing that struggle, uh, struggle in spiritual life. So sometimes uh, people say, well, uh, if Krishna consciousness is natural, then it should naturally uh, be victorious. It should naturally take over. Uh, and, and we tell the devotees, don't read these books of the Mayavadis. Be careful. Don't watch out what you read on the web. It's not that everything, on, once it's posted on the web, that it's okay. Uh, <laughs> there is this tendency to think that uh, whatever's on the web, whatever you find, you can just download it and then it's authorized. Not necessarily. There, there are things on the web which possibly are coming from contaminated sources. Hmm. So, whatever. Uh, yes, but, but then sometimes new people argue, but why do we have to be so careful? Why do we have to be so careful? In fact, if, Krish, if, if we are reading um, a book on impersonalism and next to it a book on Krishna consciousness, then Krishna consciousness, if it is the truth, if it is the truth, then it should, it should win. Yes, it should rise to the surface as, um, as we're seeing. It should. It should just be victorious. And so why do we have to be so afraid of all these other things? Why can we not hear from the Mayavadis and so on? Why is it so dangerous if, if Krishna consciousness is the truth? Mm. No, it is explained in the Nectar of Devotion that in the beginning, in spiritual life, uh, Krishna consciousness doesn't come natural at all. In the beginning, it is something that we have to artificially cultivate. So, yeah, but how is this? So, no, it is compared to the, to the process of walking. Uh, that is the analogy that is given in, uh, in the Nectar of Devotion, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, that a child cannot walk, although walking is natural. And it's a whole thing. Teach the kid to walk and it wants to crawl. No, get on your little feet. Boom, and again, boom, boom, hundreds of times, right, before finally... We can walk, and, and the, but then after a little while, they run like anything. Right? Uh, so then it is very natural. So it is like that in spiritual life. 
that in the beginning this Krishna consciousness doesn't appear to be so natural. That's the tough part. Uh, that's where it is a struggle, spiritual life. And that is where we sometimes are in doubt. I compare that to a, a desert. Uh, people who live in an oasis in the desert have never been out of there in their whole life. They only know the oasis and the desert around it. One day, a stranger comes from far away, describes a green land and so on, and invites people to go there. In order to go from the oasis of sense gratification to the spiritual world, the green land, one has to first go through the dry desert. That is the problem. You have to go out of the oasis of sense gratification through the dry desert where the hot sun of lust is burning on your head. That is the difficulty. And that is why in beginning in spiritual life there may be some struggle. And we, uh, we generally take shelter of the mode of goodness. We have to cultivate the mode of goodness because, uh, well, I say that more often, but sometimes we are here in Radhadesh and Radhadesh is transcendental and Radha Gopinath are transcendental and all the deities transcendental, Prasadam is transcendental, everything is transcendental, the devotees are transcendental, the books are transcendental and except us. We are about the only thing that is not transcendental, <laughs> if you know what I mean. That's the difficulty. Uh, the difficulty we are here and not transcendental, but surrounded by transcendental things all day long. And right? all day long. Early morning, they put that perfume, transcendental flower, flame, everything. It just keeps on coming, and still we are not transcendental. So, until we are fixed on the transcendental platform, we need at least to cultivate the mode of goodness. The mode of goodness is specifically. Uh, based on knowledge. Uh, yesterday in the, I was reading in the Pajavali, Rupa Goswami's verse book, um, anthology of verses, and there uh, it is described that on one occasion Krishna was disguising himself as a Brahmana in order to meet uh, Srimata Radharani in the disguise of a Brahmana and suddenly he had all the qualities of a Brahmana. It said he looked very grave. Right? He was very grave. And he indeed looked like a great philosopher. Yeah? And he had that whole air around him of a great, grave philosopher. So I thought that was an interesting description of the Brahmana being grave and, and having the air of a philosopher. Uh, because that is the mode of goodness, to be firmly fixed in philosophy. To be always absorbed in scripture, saptaparetanisnatam, to keep on bathing in transcendental sound, in spiritual sound, and at least in the mode of goodness one can remember. One can remember the philosophy. And thus, when the modes of material nature become bewildering, we have at least the philosophy and the mode of goodness to hold on to. That comes first. It's the intermediate stage. Uh, then, of course, when you become fixed in the mode of goodness, well, then things change again. Um, it's in my analogy, the first oasis was the oasis of sense gratification. You go to the dry stretch of the desert and then one day, lo and behold, there is water, aqua, yes, and palm trees and etc., a second oasis. Mm. And this one looks even better than the first. Guess which one it is? The oasis of the mode of goodness. And we have arrived. And once you're there, some people say, oh, this is too good. We're staying here. We're not going any further. Um, and then, the thing is, once we come to the mode of goodness, we begin to enjoy spiritual life. At that stage, the thought of not taking a bath becomes inconceivable. Something that otherwise previously was quite okay and quite normal. <laughs> it was not such, a, such an issue. Yeah? To step again in the dirty clothes from the day before was something that many did. And in fact, at one point it's convenient, the, the hoses, the pens, they stand by themselves. <laughs> uh, 
uh, in due course of time, they start to walk on their own from <laughs> all the creatures that live in there. Um, that's maybe when you even see uh, people in the mode of ignorance sitting in a towel in the laundromat washing their blue jeans, right? because lice is little uncomfortable. Um, okay, returning back to <laughs> leaving my graphic examples. The mode of goodness, yes. In the mode of goodness, we begin to enjoy the mode of goodness. Uh, now we begin to enjoy spiritual life. It's so nice to rise early in the morning. It is so, yeah, it's like uh, all those things, like alcohol, cigarettes, and all those things, meat, all disgusting now have become disgusting when one is in the mode of goodness. It's a thought, you know, it's like people drinking hair water. <laughs> How can they drink it? Yeah. People that used to smoke like a chimney can no longer tolerate it. Yeah. So, oh, can't breathe in this room. Please open the window. Um, I enjoy very much seeing those smokers in the little glass boxes on the airport. I think it's great. <laughs> we should have them everywhere in the world and put them all inside it's just, and look at them it's <laughs> I think this is this is really a great invention the glass box for the smokers um, but when one is in the mode of goodness one sees those kind of things as absolutely disgusting uh, and one begins to appreciate spiritual life and then it becomes very comfortable uh, my spiritual life is a very 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 nice spiritual life very comfortable and nice and yes we have a nice little Krishna conscious home and even even the parrot chants Hare Krishna and <laughs> the cat is a vegetarian he takes only prasadam and everything is so casey is so comfy and so nice and I'm so happy in my Krishna consciousness. No! <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but it was so nice. No! But everything was so KC. No! You have to go out. Out? Into the snow? Yes. To preach. To preach? And can't we preach via the internet? <laughs> <laughs> do tremendous preaching via the internet, yes. Maybe, but somewhere it has to lead to personal contact. No, personal contact, you could catch germs. Yes, <laughs> personal contact, yes. It has to come to that face to face. Oh my God, scary. Yeah, but it does, yes. It doesn't, it doesn't end with the internet. All right. Ultimately, we are a personal movement, and ultimately, it comes to personal contact. And ultimately, um, we must go beyond the mode of goodness and be prepared to even sacrifice our comfort in spiritual life for benedicting the fallen conditioned souls. Only then, only then are we coming to the pure spiritual platform. Only then. Um, I cannot carry on with this lecture and turn it into a huge seminar, which you easily get into. If you get on the topic of Guru Tattva, you could go for, well, a month every day. Um, so we're scratching the surface. But the point that we want to make as a conclusion is that uh, when we become absorbed in benedicting others, uh, when we become absorbed in being the instrument of Krishna, in somehow or other uh, being an instrument of Krishna's mercy, then everything starts to fall in place. And then everything starts to work. Then our spiritual life starts to work. Then we are always with Krishna. Then all the relationships start to work then our movement starts to work. Now everyone, uh, everyone, irregardless in what position he is, has to attain that sadhu platform. Uh, uh, the other day, 
we were in the um, Singh Eksetra and we came at the point of Dhruva Maharaj who was killing all these yakshas and it got a bit out of hand and then Swayambhuva Manu came and Swayambhuva Manu was sort of reminding Dhruva about the sadhu platform. It was basically uh, indicating you have come off the sadhu platform. And I thought it was interesting because it shows how a king or a leader has to first be on the sadhu platform. Uh, the sadhu platform then being the instrument of the mercy of the Lord. So if any leader, any husband, any, anyone right, is first on the platform of being an instrument of the mercy of the Lord, uh, and then after takes different roles uh, in the world. I am the teacher here. <coughs> sit straight. <laughs> I can sit properly. Like that kind of mood of asserting authority. Uh, all different authorities only work if first that basis of sadhu is there. And if that's missing, then anyone who becomes an authority uh, begins to cause distress to others, yeah, somehow or other. So, uh, thus, when we come to the spiritual platform, the platform of, of just being the instrument of Krishna's mercy, giving up selfishness or self-interest, um, acting in that way, then our spiritual life begins to work, then society begins to work, and then Guru Tattva is manifest. I think I'll just end on this note, because you must end on a high note. So, any questions, any comments? Krishna's warning. <laughs> Krishna's warning. Watch out now. Yeah, so Krishna's smile. What is a smile? A smile is a welcome. Yeah? It's welcome. Of course, sometimes you have false smiles. It's a false welcome. But smile is, is welcome. Welcome. So when Krishna is showing us his beauty in this world, it is a welcome to the spiritual world. When we see the horrors in this material world, that's a warning. Get out of here, quick. Yeah. I always remember the bus tour that Mahaprabhu organized to Scandinavia, and we were driving, and Mahaprabhu had organized that to get us in the mood for Scandinavia to show us nice uh, videos of polar bears and penguins and all these things, right? And at one point, we see these huge penguins, one and a half meter penguins on the ice. And it is uh, in the winter at minus 70. Right? Uh, they were sitting on the eggs. In fact, the ladies went to the south and it was a man's job to sit on those eggs. <laughs> and, uh, and, well, it was too cold. It's so minus 70. And the guys were roughing it up. But sitting there in the dark polar night on those eggs. Then when spring finally arrived and the first little rays of light appeared, those male uh, penguins, they went south and to some islands and their wives were already waiting for them and they had a vacation on the beach. Meanwhile, as the sun was shining, the Little cracks appeared in the eggs and all those little penguins came out, hundreds of them at the same time. And they were on the slippery slope of the ice. And since their feet sort of have natural skis on them, it, <laughs> it didn't take them long. They figured it out in a matter of seconds. And before you knew it, there were hundreds of penguins <laughs> skiing down the slope. And it was really ecstasy. And then, you know, they went like straight for the edge of the water. And it was like a, a bit of a, it was going up a bit. And they were coming down the hill and just flying up. And 
hundreds of them diving in the water at the same time. And then from the water emerged this youth mouse of a killer whale who swallowed all my penguins. <laughs> what a shock. Yeah, that was heavy. <laughs> I agree. <Yeah. laughs> it's one of the one of the big, heavy, traumatic moments in my life. <laughs> my penguins. <laughs> oh God. Absolutely. But it was very illustrating, huh? About what this material life is all about. <laughs> oh God. There's always some killer whale somewhere around the corner. Yeah. So when you see those things, you know, you start to think, don't ya? You start to think, it's like, what am I doing in this place? It's, it's not as comfy as I thought it was. Even in the mode of goodness, there can still be something happening like that. So maybe, maybe the mode of goodness is not good enough. Maybe still better get to the transcendental plane so that we can get out of here. Time. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Regarding your analogy of waves, we speak to the first wave, it means sense gratification. Yeah. And from that, we, we have to go to a green area, which is more, more dry area. Dry area. Dry, dry area. Dry area. Dry Nothing there. there. Yeah, we have to go so through. Survive and now, what what the analogy means is that in spiritual life, first there is austerity. There is without austerity, it's not possible, because you may have some tastes, but not just so much higher taste that you uh, that it all goes automatically. So first, it is struggle, and we need knowledge. We need higher taste and knowledge at the same time. We get some higher taste sometimes. People, have you also seen the situation where you live from Sunday feast to Sunday feast? <laughs> yeah? It's like, you know, it's the Sunday feast and you stash a lot so it will last you till the, the last sweets are finished by Wednesday. So that's okay. You live till Wednesday. Thursday is absolute misery. It's Rahu's day, any day. Best is to stay in bed. Then Friday, you feel like blooping, but Saturday is Harinam. It's not so bad. Harinam is okay. So Saturday is quite okay. And it's the day before the Sunday feast. <laughs> so in this way, you survive from Sunday feast to Sunday feast. Right? And sort of somehow or other hang in there in Krishna consciousness. Right? And then gradually it gets better. Right? Gradually you start to actually stay because you get some higher knowledge and appreciate that maybe Krishna consciousness is the better way of life. And uh, Slowly the senses, they calm down a little bit, a little, and it gets better and better. So as we're going through the dry stretch, gradually it changes the landscape. There's a little green here and there. In the beginning it's all sand. <laughs> But then it gets more green, and finally, mode of goodness. And then you start to love your, your nice, comfy, casey. <laughs> but that's not good enough. Say it louder and more clear. Who? God. Makes God? The what? It. what? Oh, what? I thought God. What makes the... Um, there's two things. It, it's always mercy that makes one go beyond the mode, the mode of goodness and enjoying the mode of goodness. Uh, it is mercy. That mercy can come in different ways. It can come 
in the form of nectar and it can come in the form of a boot coming from the back. Uh, it can come in different ways, the mercy. Uh, it can come in the form of suffering, it can come in the form of, uh, of knowledge, it can come in the form... It certainly comes in the form of a spiritual master right? or of the Vaishnavas who are the repositories of that mercy or the, the spiritual master is the mercy manifestation of Krishna. So certainly uh, the spiritual masters can awaken the desire in us to, to go to the pure platform of making pure sacrifice for Krishna's interest. Uh, just like Prabhupada, it's like too much sacrifice. It's just inconceivable. How can anyone just be so austere? Right? He was. Uh, but so deep in his Krishna consciousness and then in inspired that in his disciples, in his, in his followers, who did amazing things then, which would for many not be so easy to do now. Because now they don't have that personal touch. So personal mercy. But it's mercy that makes us move. And if it's not the nectar type of mercy, then it's the boot.